and then we'll, we'll just keep That's Sorry about that, folks. Record. Uh, right. We're all Hello, Pat. How are you? Um, Hi. We're just Hi. talking about... Hi. Uh, Hi. Good to see you. Good to see you, man. And we have, we also have uh, Gareth Slate home, and we Bruno Stahl has joined us. Uh, is Bruno there? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Bruno did uh, Jurassic Punk. Yeah. Um, and two of my favourite characters there, uh, Dada Derda and Joe Megiddo, um, which uh, I hope go on for a, a long, long time. And Bruno, I noticed in his uh, credits, had been praised by no less than Richard Corbin, so I'm very impressed. Is is Bruno there? Yes. Yeah. Hello. Can you hear me? He did ah, join. Yeah. Ah, hello there. How are you? Good to see is you. Everything all. okay, Bruno? Yeah, fine. Yeah. Yeah. So what? How did you get involved with Facebook? Sorry, the audio is quite how, quite low. How did you get involved with Facebook? Are we having a Zoom problem? Yeah, the audio is quite bad right now. I tried to. Okay. Yeah. We could come back to you. Yeah, I'll we'll come back to you. Yeah, move on. There's some other, there's some other space walk uh, artists here as well. There's uh, Ian Ashcroft, James Newell, and Simon Hodgkiss Rogers. Right. Um, can... Oh, yeah. Hi. Sorry. Right in the middle there. Right. Hi, Simon. And hi, there's, Ian, there's uh, no, hi, James. There's now 37 people have joined us, and I've only ever done this with uh, three people, so uh, this is, uh, I'm having to take notes here. Um, oh, Ian what? Ashcroft, oh. uh, Hell, Hellbreaker. Can, can, we, can we hear from Ian? Is he in there? Hi, uh, yeah. Can you hear me? Yes, perfectly. Yeah. How are Hello. you? I'm good, thank you. Um, what, uh, how did you get involved with Space Warp, Ian? Um, well, I've been doing some small press work with Accent UK and released a comic called Keir Wordsmith. And I'd also done some work with um, Tony Esmond on the Awesome Comics podcast. Oh, yeah. And then, yeah, and then um, Johnny Ottaway, who's on this call, kindly contacted me and said, have you heard Pat Mills is looking for artists? So I hadn't. So I, I had a look on Pat's website and I looked through all the different stories and Hellbreaker was the one that I was drawn to the most. So then I started to produce some work that I was putting up on Instagram. Pat noticed it, said he liked it. So that gave me a bit more confidence. And then I submitted a page. I think it was page seven that um, Pat had asked for. Hardest so page. The hardest page it was. Deliberately. So, uh, <laughs> Pat said, I sent that to Pat and he um, he got back and he said I was on board. So that was an amazing feeling. And then uh, we just went from there and Pat gave me loads of advice and guidance because I'm quite new to comics and I needed probably a bit more support than the other artists and just took me through the process. It's just a, It was just a fantastic education, really, and uh, such a pleasure to be involved in, in a project like this. So... Yeah, that's how I got involved, and um, I'm looking forward to hopefully getting on phase two and carrying on the story of Hellbreaker. And yeah, it's been lovely to read all the feedback and all the great reviews we've been getting. So all of it's just been, a, like I said, a great experience. Along with getting paid this month as well, that was pretty good too. So. I know, <laughs> a bonus. Yeah. And are you working on anything else just now, Ian? Yeah, since I've worked on um, Hellbreaker, I've just done a 24-page, it's the third issue of Keir Wordsmith, so that'll be coming to Kickstart either next month or, or the month after. Um, I'm working with another small press creator um, on, on a different project entirely, but that's just in its starting points, really, just on design stuff. And then just, that's it really at the moment, and then we'll see where we go from there, but I'm a full-time secondary school teacher as well, so it's kind of it's difficult at the oh. moment doing all the planning and recording and everything for that. So, is is that all on Zoom as well? 
Teams, that's all on Teams. So like this all like, yeah. yeah, this is all I do all, all week. Just sit looking at my laptop, staring at people's faces. <laughs> <laughs> is, it, is, it, is it going okay so far? What, what age group do you teach? 11 to 16. So yeah, it's going it's going it's going well as well as you can expect. I mean, the students are from quite a deprived area, so they got they all got free uh, iPads, and so they're all set up now so they can engage in lessons. It's been good. This very subtly leads into a question I was going to ask: Do, do you use comics in teaching? Yeah, we do a whole scheme of work. Well, I, I, I made sure there was, uh, did a whole scheme of work on it. We It's sort of like an anatomy lesson, looking at proportions of the figure and stuff like that, but we tie it into then going away and creating their own, uh, we call it the Eco Warrior Project. So they go away and create their own Eco Warrior and, uh, and design that around what kind of special powers they'd have and what they'd need. So it allows them to learn about the proportions of the figure, but then go on to create and be creative and design characters and backstories and stuff like that for the characters. So get some really good ideas from that. Well, that's good. That's quite exciting. And yeah. Pat, I don't know if I, yeah, Pat, I, and I don't know if I ever told you years ago. Sorry? Sorry, Pat. No, go ahead. Where you go? I, I don't know if I ever told you, but years ago in a previous life, when I was a secondary teacher, I used Charlie's War to teach the First World War um, because it's difficult for people who are, uh, well, I've, I've, no, I've never seen a battlefield to imagine what it's like to, in these trenches and the stuff that's going on. And you and Joe Cahoon summed up that whole atmosphere and made those First World War poems that you're expected to teach even though they're very depressing. Uh, but it brought it all alive. And we, we used Charlie's War. And then one of my students uh, insisted that we look at Slain because he wanted to talk about the Irish Annals. So you used in, in my old college at least twice by me. I think, uh, do, do, you, do, you, do you like the idea of comics in teaching? Yeah, um, I think if, um, if for example, um, with uh, Charlie's War, if it had, um, if I hadn't written those uh, very left of center commentaries in the back of the books, they'd probably be um, on, a, on a teaching list somewhere. I know they're on an unofficial, <laughs> but because there's all this uh, anti-establishment abuse by me in the back, uh, I, I can't see any uh, government body uh, <laughs> uh, ordering those books, but I know that unofficially many, many teachers throughout the country use Charlie's Walk because, I mean, Joe's evocation of the battles is, is you know, he, he's, well, he's just a um, world-class artist. I was so lucky to, to have him uh, to be working with him. It was just fantastic. Um, coming back to Ian, I just wanted to add a footnote that one of the reasons why I was particularly drawn to Ian's work is, and I, and I think uh, somewhere down the line, hopefully within Space Warp, that will reach a wide audience. Uh, he's a natural, and I say this in a complimentary way, <laughs> he's got that twilight buzz, you know, that, that appeal to adolescence, uh, that kind of romantic comic strip look that... Uh, uh, was was quite widespread in the past, but has I don't know it's it's not really been focused on in recent years. And so, if there was ever some uh, great teen love uh, um, graphic novel, I mean, Ian is the the natural one to do it. I mean, you look at uh, Hellbreaker. I mean, it's really hot. And, and uh, I, I was saying to Ian that uh, um, you know, with Valentine's Day coming up tomorrow, you know, we we might see an example of him drawing, uh, you know, these very romantic, very sexy characters uh, he draws. And, and that's his, uh, I think, unique selling point that you, you, uh, it, you need to major on, in, in my view, not just on Hellbreaker, but elsewhere. You probably do. I mean, all your characters look really hot. It's fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Pat. That's very kind. Yeah, it was, it's difficult when you, 
Because when you're aiming a book at a younger audience as well, with a character like DLR, who's the central character in Hellbreaker, I was, I had to think about how I was going to design him for a long time because I knew I wanted it to appeal to younger readers. And a guy in a tux, you could either go towards like a Sean Connery, James Bond or a Bruce Wayne or something like that. And we didn't really want that. So getting that character's look right was really quite difficult. Um, and making him someone who's going to appeal to the younger readership as well was really important. So hopefully that that's one of the reasons why I hope my art is well suited to Hellbreaker because we could find a slightly different look to him, maybe perhaps a younger a younger look as well. So um, the chemistry between uh, De La Rue, the the, the Hellbreaker and uh, the female cop who's uh, coming after him. I mean, it's really there on the page. It, it was in my script, but there would be many artists who would not be able to uh, evoke that, that feeling. So you, I'd have to compensate for it in, in other ways. But in your case, I don't have to. I mean, you can really see that, uh, that they're, from their body language, the way they're looking at each other, that uh, it's got that potential of um, killing Eve, I think, you know, that, that kind of, uh, that would be one. Go, you know? Thank you. Plenty, plenty of film material there, eh? Plenty of film yeah. material. Um, did James Newell appear? Um, yeah. Is James about? I want to say he's over there. <laughs> <laughs> over there. Can you hear me there okay? In the yeah. virtual space. Can you hear me? Yes, James. Yes. Yep. Yeah. Hi. Hello. How's it Hello. going? Yeah. I'm John. Um, Hi, you did you did Flair and you're also the letterer. I think letterers are incredibly important. Um, there's an old strip, uh, Little Nemo in Slumberland, where the artwork's absolutely magnificent. And oh, the thanks very much. Lettering is about as bad as it gets. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I think I a think letterer can really, really enhance the, the look of a page. So how did you get involved with uh, Spacewalk? Yeah, I seen it come up on Pat's How did blog. You get involved? I seen it. I seen it come up on Pat's blog, and uh, uh -huh. and I just threw in a, uh, an email through the blog there, and just to get involved, really. So, um, I think I asked. Uh, I'll do art or lettering or anything at all. I just wanted to be involved with the project. You you previously done work for Zardjas, is that correct? Yeah, I've been doing. Work with Sarajos for the last number of years. Uh, it's uh, it's good work. The good guys. And you you're based in Ireland. Yeah. Yeah. West Coast in Galway. Oh, the nice the nice bit. You get. Yeah. Great, ah, great city. Great city. If I if I was um, you know, I thought about moving to Ireland from time to time, and Galway was always the number one. Yeah. It's because yeah. of the storms. That's right. <laughs> Lovely place. Um, I saw uh, Phil Vaughn's name there. Is, is Phil about? Hello, Phil. He was earlier. Uh, He's dropped. Was. Yes, John, I am. Yeah, hi, John. Hi, 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 hi. Um, So, how did you get involved, Phil? What, what was your involvement in the, the Spacewalk project? I was, I was very much on the edges, John. I, I just came in um, uh, quite, quite late in the day. Just to help out on some of the, the marketing stuff with, with Lisa and did a little video uh, piece and uh, a couple other oh, bits. Oh, yeah, you did the video. Yeah, well, that was important, yeah. Well, it was easy because all the artwork was there and uh, it was great. I, I got all the artwork given to me unlettered so I could sort of semi-animate it. Um, and uh, we, we, we threw something together last, well, started it last April, I think, um, around about that time. And then there was a couple of just interior things, just this just, just small, small jobs, but it was great to be involved. And, uh, and and subsequently, actually, Pat and Lisa did a class for me. I've, I've just taken on a new role at, at De Montfort um, teaching um, concept and comics art. And we've actually got a kind of live project at the moment uh, that Pat uh, wrote a script for, for the students. Maybe Pat can, can talk a little bit about that. We're, we're in the process of that at the moment. It was quite exciting. Yeah, and so, I, so the course is going quite well, Phil. Yeah, it's, it's all been run remotely at the moment, so much like yes, you. Yeah, it's, yeah. Yeah, it's all it's all done through through teams mostly. Okay. And uh, I see just to add, 
Sorry. not getting a lot of free adverts here. It's Microsoft Teams that are getting the adverts, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was just going to add to what Phil said there, that uh, um, so his class uh, are going to all draw their own version of a, a special four-page uh, story of Futant that, that I, I wrote for the occasion. And uh, it features new characters and so on. Um, and that's an incredibly demanding thing to ask of them. And, uh, and as Phil said, he wanted to really throw them in the deep end and really challenge them rather than what shall we say, if you look at manga, for example, the stories can be quite slow. They only have one figure. Do you know what I mean? Who appears over several pages, close ups of heads and so forth. Whereas the British tradition, of which I'm probably a prime example, is you throw in everything bar the kitchen sink on every page, because that's actually certainly what younger readers want. They, they want the lot. They want action, story, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So I wrote uh, this four-page story with that in mind. And uh, I'm going to be very looking forward to what the, um, uh, what the artists, the students come up with, because we did a session with them, um, uh, and I, I think their age group was around 19, 20, that sort of thing. And they were, they were coming out with their original pictures for stories. And I was, I was gobsmacked how good they were. Uh, I, I've done uh, this kind of uh, virtual work with students in the past, and they often look really bored, like when it's in lunch, you know. But the, these guys, were really on it. They really, uh, uh, I, I don't know where, I don't know how they all came together, Phil, but uh, uh, you have an amazing class there. So I'm expecting uh, something pretty awesome, I think. Well, I actually saw, just as briefly, I actually saw some of the initial thumbnails yesterday. We did a class yesterday. I've not, not followed them on yet. Pat, I should have been more prepared and had them ready to show. Because some of the, some of the, uh, results are, are looking really good. And what's interesting, they're all working on the same script. So you've got about 30 students all with different interpretations of that script, um, which is a real good test of, of how, how different people approach a script. And it's, it's brilliant from a teaching point of view because you could put them together as a cohort and have that kind of peer learning as well as you know having that individual one-to-one -one session. So it's been a, a brilliant learning experience and it's great to have the opportunity. So, so thanks for that. Mm. Is that why it was four pages to make it manageable for everybody? Sorry, John, that to cut out a little bit there. Could you say Sorry. that? Is that why it was four pages just to make it manageable for everybody? It's it was kind of a, yeah. It was more of a test. I mean, what 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 I wanted was was something that was sort of grounded in in some sort of reality. So having the parameters in place of four pages and having to work to someone else's script rather than your own thing. It, it puts in certain parameters that, that are, are useful when you're teaching. Um, someone's asked in the, in the comments, how long do they have? They've got a whole semester, but really it's only if you count it one day a week um, for, for about 12 weeks. So it, it, essentially it's two weeks, I suppose, in, in real world times. Obviously they're working it out with that as well. But, um, but what, what was great about the script, uh, it, again, because it, it, of the subject matter, it combined that kind of the, the, the school aspect with the sort of science fiction elements, the fantasy elements. Uh, it means that they have to draw from life. So they're not just doing kind of manga-esque kind of work, which, which Pat kind of touched upon. I'm, I'm a massive fan of manga and anime, but at this stage and in, in the early stages of development, I wanted them to, to concentrate on core drawing skills. And this script certainly plays up to that. That sounds very exciting, Phil. Yeah, we'll, we'll hear more about that in the future. Yeah. Sure. I, I gather Simon Hodgkiss Rogers is with us. Simon, there, yes, there he is up in the corner. Hello. Uh, what was your? How did you get involved, Simon? You did uh, the logos and designs, which is crucially important. Oh, you're, you're on mute. You're on mute. Ah, no. Ah, uh, yeah. Ah, uh, <laughs> on mute. How's that? Yay! Oh. Yay. <laughs> Hi, Simon. That's Hi, Simon. Yes. <laughs> How are you all doing? Hi. We're all doing great. Good, so good. Tell um, us about how you get involved in Space Warp. Um, I was actually the 
first artist to jump on Space Wolf. I heard about it like the moment it, that Pat put out any word about it, to be honest. Um, and I stayed up that night and drew an entire panel for Jurassic Man, which is a story that really spoke to me. I was the first artist on Jurassic Man as it was then, um, but I'm disabled and had a lot of health issues that came up. Uh, I was about five pages into the project at the time, as Pat will tell you, and like, as in five pretty much finished pages, and I had to just leave because of my health, unfortunately. Um, I'd also done like the warp though for Pat, um, and we'd gone over a lot of story elements for Space Warp. I, it was while it was Pat and I were talking one of the days via email, and um, like I said about the, the the lords of the warp as well and like i was like i i see these creatures that sort of run the whole show and pat went that's brilliant <laughs> <laughs> so I think, um, <laughs> it was so I'm, I'm really like happy that i saw those things come to life that you buy another artist don't get me wrong but it was amazing um and yeah, like i've been a fan of pat's work since the 1980s um i was a little kid and saw like someone gave me one of the comics slain and uh, I, I just fell in love with Pat's writing um, so as soon as I heard that he got this project coming up uh, and needed artists I instantly jumped on stayed up the entire night drew out a whole panel that I've still got actually um, very rough it was just a, a, a rough thing but Pat saw it and went yeah that that that's it and like got straight back to him and he was like if you can tidy it up because like I had stayed up the entire night drawn this rough and um pat just saw something in it and we worked probably for best part of a year almost um and then like i unfortunately had to work away but walk away um due to my health uh, i was hospitalized um rather badly and still suffering yeah. now with all that um so it, it's been a bit of a slog, but I've got like pages and pages of work that I did for what was then Jurassic Man, which it, it's a very different story to Jurassic Punk, but along the same line. Um, but it focused more on the solitude of this one person that was like basically in a torn world because of how the warps come along. And then he meets um, the young girl that's the, the punk as he's basically almost prepared to die. Um, at the hands of the dinosaurs because he's just walking through this city on his own there's nothing left anywhere apart from destruction and death and these creatures that are trying to pull him apart um he's lost his whole family and he's as he's walking through we see him remembering that family and sort of talking to them and yeah it, it was a it was a very different story and a lot slower pace and like it ultimately became Jurassic Punks, and there are bits in Jurassic Punks where you go, oh yeah, that's, you can see where Pat's gone, okay, we'll keep that bit and we'll move from that. And so it's changed completely, but it's also very similar in parts, and it's amazing to look at because, like, I say having the original panels as well, and it's like, okay, that that little tiny bit there, that, that's because I said that, and then, like, with Pat, you know, and it, it, it's incredible. Um, I was really lucky to be involved with Pat just I, I've been a massive he is pretty much a hero <laughs> and so when he said like yeah yeah come on board I was just flabbergasted and then like I said things didn't work out quite as I wanted but yeah it was an incredible experience doing anything with the guy because talking with him you see the pieces of how this comic is coming together just slowly falling in place and then one day he clicks with it and the next thing, it's just all there. And he, he's like, yeah, this is how it's working. And you're like, how did you do that? <laughs> he's just incredible with how he works it all. Can I just um, say, oh, I, think, I think, Simon, you were really instrumental in, in um, crystallizing the, the warp itself. You know, we didn't actually have um, a visual, a clear visual idea. Not at all, no. Of, of, of uh, that sort of visual representation of what it was. And you came up with that. And so, you know, that that is, as, as John said, that is how we then developed the logo. Um, yeah. your, your walk is actually in the uh, sort of end papers kind of thing. That's that, on page one, yeah. Yeah. And yeah, yeah. 
um, the one that it was amazing seeing that. <laughs> so you know that that's that that was really crucial. That kind of identity, you know, gi giving the warp itself an identity, and it kind of brought in that kind of sinister. And yeah. it, until it's kind of made flesh, you, it's just a kind of concept. Of course. Now, as soon as I talked about the warp with Pat, like the image that I got in my head was just this galaxy that's sort of almost coming in and tearing apart everything. So it's sharp, it's jagged, but it, it's got these tendrils that you can you can imagine just pulling at space. So like as soon as we spoke, I got the image in my head. And I was just like, I'll draw that. <laughs> well, that was, that was the thing with Simon, just to come in here. I, I, and we've, we've said this before, that Simon has so many ideas. And, you know, even someone who's 100% fit would have trouble keeping up with them. And you say, hey, I want to draw that as well. And I say, OK, well, let's have a look at it. And it, it was always inspiring. So there were, um, I always described Simon as, um, uh, for people who know about 2000 AD, that there was the art supremo, Doug Church, who um, very much inspired me and we inspired each other. And I think Simon was very much the Doug Church of Space War, in as much as he would always keep coming up with these new ideas and these wonderful ideas. And, um, and, and we had trouble keeping up with them, but they were all great, Port Lords, Thank you. Uh, and, and coming back to, for example, um, Jurassic Punks or Jurassic Man, as it then was, um, is an interesting example of how stories develop. Because um, uh, I like the, the look of uh, Simon's original drawing. And I thought, I remember discussing this with uh, Lisa and saying, we we're going to set it in New York, of course, because I'd seen the, the Omega Man and most most apocalypse has happened in, in New York, <laughs> some, with some justification, I think. Um, yeah, it, it's always put me off going. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's always a disaster there. And, and so I, I, I looked at that. I don't know what it's come to her. I thought, you know what, uh, could we, I don't know if this artist has a feeling for New York. I mean, these places, the buildings in the background, they look like, uh, 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 a shopping precinct on a on a fairly tough housing estate. I, I drew it based on the shopping precinct, like just down the road from me. I was like, I yeah, that's I, what I want. You I, know? Thought, I thought as much. And so then Lisa said to me, well, why do you have to have it set in New York anyway? You know, in other words, what is it with this, uh, th this kind of um, a base Friend. to, to, you know, it's always, oh, it's going to be uh, New York or Los Angeles or whatever. And she rightly said, why don't you set it in Britain? And of course I said, yeah, you're absolutely right. So then yeah. I said to Simon, um, whereabouts do you live in Britain? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he said, Stoke-on-Trent, which I know, I barely know of. But um, both Lisa and I know Liverpool, which is arguably not that far away. And... Uh, uh, so that's when we decided to go to Liverpool. And of course, this drew us down another rabbit hole because Liverpool arguably has some of the finest uh, architecture, you know, city urban architecture is wonderful uh, because it's also demanding on the artist. And then- It was Simon brilliant said, though. I love drawing that. Like yeah, I, I, I spent time just looking at those buildings and I was like, yeah, I, I can see. And Pat had asked for the for Liver building specifically. And I, I saw, <laughs> I saw um, like images of it that a great friend of mine has just popped up in the chat. He actually lives in Liverpool and he was like, I'll go and take photos for you. And so he spent the day like walking around, taking pics all around the actual base of the live building as well. So I could post it in the actual street that was directly under it. I could do this sort of failing degrading city that the dinosaurs were sort of encroaching upon as as Gerard was walking through and it was all based so if somebody was walking that knew the area they'd be able to like read the comic and go that's literally right there you know and I, I wanted to do little bits like that for it and Pat picked up on it and he was like that is it, it, these easter eggs that we got it yeah it made the comic come to life you know it, it was, it, well, the, the, the thing also was that at this point, um, Jurassic Man was the only story that, that I think 
I, I was kind of connecting with an artist over because I was still writing the others. So it kind of set the template for the stand. Yeah. Oh. Oh, internet's dropped. Yes. We want well, to we'll just keep talking. <laughs> and this kind of interaction. Maybe. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They sometimes just yeah. Um. So the, the, looking at the, just coming back to just a couple more things on Jurassic Man. Um. I think some of it that the Omega Man, rather gloomy character. Uh, I think you brought something out there rather special. Do you know what I mean? That the mm. main character uh, had a certain energy. Uh, if you like, maybe it was a kind of alter ego of yourself or something. But it's very so much, yeah. I, I I felt that, uh, and so it's interesting that often um, with all, and this goes for all stories really um, that the obviously it's true for, for the writer as well, um, that the characters are often fantasy alter egos of the artist. So totally. if, one if, if one artist is particularly, what should we say, up or particularly down, that's going to be reflected um, yeah. in the story. And it's better, in my view, to go with that and mm. to, to, to f go with that energy flow rather than say, oh, can you make it more upbeat? And the artist yeah. involved might say, well, actually, you know, my dad just died and, you know, my hands exactly. dead and, you know, I don't feel particularly up. So it's better to go with what to bring out from the artist, yeah. whatever they're personally going through within reason. Uh, I mean, of there's, course. there's one famous example, which uh, um, I, I think you'll, you'll know about, John, that, uh, um, there was an artist who did a really great horror series for France, Bon Dessinée. So mm -hmm. it's really bad taste, it's really vile, it's, and it has a big following, you know, because they're French and, and just as we'd like it as well, probably. And then somewhere down the line, he got married or uh, whatever, and uh, so his wife has a kid, and he's suddenly full of this tender love and compassion for the human race. And, <laughs> oh, my baby, and all this kind of stuff. So he starts <laughs> bringing that into his work, and sales go crash, they go <laughs> right down. It was uh, Fasheed, uh, uh, Comics USA, who told me the story. And, yeah. uh, uh, and, so, and so Fasheed said to him, fuck's sake, you know, get back to the misery and the, and the pain. You don't want to know about, you know, the joys of fatherhood. The readers don't care. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, that, that's where a lot of the solitude that um, Jurassic Man had when we started, that, that's where that came from, because, like, with my disability, um, I was partially paralysed a, a few years ago, three or four years ago now, um, and, like, I'm literally stuck in the house 24-7, I can't even get out the front door. Um, without a fleet of people coming to help me, basically, which I get outside maybe three times a year, and that's even into wow. the garden. Um, I don't generally get out in the living room. Um, and that's where a lot of the, the solitude parts um, for Jurassic Man came from. Because, of course, like, I have to run through things in, in my head to try and get some escape occasionally, to be honest. Um, and that's where a lot of my art comes from. Actually, all of it. It's all about my escape. Um, and I think that really showed, especially in the early parts of Jurassic Man, where he's just so alone because he's walking through these cities and there's there's nothing and no one and occasionally he'll see an obstacle to climb, but that that's all that he's got in those opening pages, just obstacles. That's his company, um, and that was very reflective of my own life. Even like, in fact, even more so during COVID because of course people can't come along now and assist me to get outside. So the only time I've been out is to go to hospital um, in, a, in the back of an ambulance. So at the moment, like, my artwork is even more reflective of battle and obstacles. And that, that's all you're really seeing now. Like, very, I, actually, I'm, I'm doing a piece for Space War right now. Um, right now. But yeah. I'm not sure whether it'll come up. Hey, let's see. Um, that's my original version, idea of the War Lords. That's how I saw them in my head. Oh, wow. Yeah, that's really good. Hi, guys. 
That's great. And as always, lovely black and white work there. And that yeah, I, one I, of the I, other things that attracted me to your work is that you thank you. You have that uh, uh, kind of classic black and white style. Um, thank you. Phil. My old art editor Doug Church uh, always approved of. He he disapproved of artists using pens. Yeah, <laughs> I don't think he'd have approved of Carlos Esquerra, or I, well, I can't remember what Carlos used, but it's certainly not uh, a brush as far as I'm aware. But I like that kind of, it, it, there's that European tradition of that very strong black and white artwork, which you seem to uh, graduate, you know, you've come to that very naturally. And I was just yeah. going to add a, a footnote, there's probably not much solace for your situation, but doubtless you are aware of there's any number, I say, I say any number, there's, there's a number of creators, writers, artists, musicians who, you know, life has dealt them some shit cards and it's forced them into that kind of creative process that you're describing. And yeah. so I hope somewhere down the line that uh, not just on spacewalk, but elsewhere that, you know, you, you get the kind of reward for that. You know what I mean? Your, your yeah. work is acknowledged because, but it's hard when you're just living inside your own head, as it were, uh, without Exactly, that. exactly. But th then we're all doing it now on one level. Yeah, exactly. Much, in, in all honesty, like, I've seen a lot of people talking about like, you know, with COVID, they don't get to go outside, that they're, they're stuck in and they're feeling like claustrophobic and whatnot with it. And I'm like, yep. I, I can completely relate um, because those first few months, especially are a massive adjustment process. And I went through that a few years ago, like back in 2014, 2015, when it was starting, um, I'd already broached the process people have now been going through in the last few months. So when my friends are talking about it saying, you know, I, 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 I've got no creativity left in me because I'm feeling so pent up. I'm like, okay use it don't think of it like that think of it as okay what does it create it, it creates claustrophobia so turn your, your hand to doing some horror and you know try writing about this keep a diary of what's going on so you can look at those feelings later as well which is something i do a lot of if i especially at night because i suffer insomnia greatly I, I don't sleep any more than two hours a day um and so i'll keep at night when i'm completely alone a diary of how I'm feeling at that time, including with sketches. And then I'll use those later. I'll go, right, that, that was really good. Yeah, let's bring that into this story and start writing something there. And I've got like about four comics that have started writing. I've got about six pages of each one done. Uh, um, I want to come in on you there, Simon, because all of us, writers as well as artists, have exactly <laughs> this issue. We all have endless projects on the go. And we only can, and, the challenge, particularly for you, but I, because I, I remember thinking at the time, is find some model where you can complete the project. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. I, I'm the same. I've got four books that I'm I'm meant to write as well as Space War. There's probably a couple of other things as well. And I think all of us as creators, we think, oh yeah, I, I want to do that. I want to do that. Yeah. And it's if you can find the magic key whereby you can start something, go to the middle, and finish it. Yeah, uh, I think that's a great objective. And if you figure out how to do it, let me know. <laughs> I've, I've done it with it well. one of mine now. Um, like, as in, I've got to a point where I can send it off and try and get it published, essentially. I wanted to send it to you, actually, Pat, see what you think. Um, because I've got, like, six pages it's drawn, coloured as well. I've actually gone for colour on this one. Yeah. Um, and I was like, yeah, that's the sort of thing that Pat would like to read. Because <laughs> it's about time travel, but it's all actually using historical characters, but only if you know, you know, it, it, it's again, the Easter egg thing. Um, and it, it's kind of, you could almost fit it in to Space Wars because it's about a guy going through time to stop it being destroyed and taken advantage of by these people um, that have figured out how to travel themselves. And basically some unknown force has plucked him out of his own time and gone, you're the only person that we can see at the moment that would be able to stop these. So go and do it or we erase you. That's it. You, there's no ever you, you know? And that's essentially his weapon. And yeah, it, I'm writing little bits like that quite a lot. Um, 
I'm essentially drawing them out because it keeps me busy. <laughs> but I'm finding that, again, through this whole COVID thing, other people are mentioning things. Um, it inspires that little spark in yourself. And you can go, right, that's what I want to do. Like, I can, I can riff off that a bit and turn it into something and talk with them and, like, try and come up with projects with other people as well. Um, I, I think that's very important. That's what Pat managed to do perfectly with Space Wolf, was turn it into a project with other people that can synchronise with each other without even meeting, actually. They got all that artwork done to make a perfect little comic, but didn't have any influence over each other apart from Pat syncing it all together in the middle. And it was a really incredible feat when you think about it. Um, and I think we need more of that in British comics, especially. Um, like I say, especially with British comics, they've sort of walked away from the energy that they've had for all these years. And they're, they're now trying to latch on to things. Whereas Pat didn't do that. He just went, okay, this is what we're doing. Yeah, we've got an audience we want to target, but let's tell a story rather than try and just bring people in with nothing there, no substance. And like I say, Space Wars, it had these stories that Pat very clearly saw um, and wanted to tell actual tales rather than just try and get some readers in just for the sake of it, which other publications, which will remain nameless, seem to do quite a lot. Um, that's something that I really respected, and that's one of the reasons I wanted to join Space Wolf, just because of that. It's fantastic. Oh, that's great. That's great, Simon. A couple of things, a couple of questions have been popping up in the chat, uh, if I can address them. Um, first of all, just talk to Simon there, um, but you're going to need a kind of um, a blu ray edition of spacewalk maybe to include the, the original version of uh, Jurassic Man and things you know, like that. There's a few pages um, that are, have you um, thought of just uh, lettering that, that doing could other editions. I mean I know you had the digital extra story which was great. I'm, I'm oh sorry. my sound's gone bear with me. Sound with yeah. that one, John. Sorry, yeah. could, you, could you say that again? And sure. Pat, the, the, the digital um, stuff. Is the sound gone? A bit. The sound's cutting out. Is that me? To say it again. Hello. We, we can hear right. you now. Uh, I'm very good at sound. I was talking about <laughs> um, right. I'm saying language. That's it. Um, I was talking about uh, um, all the extras. You put a digital extra story, which was a good idea, um, and all that stuff that Simon's got. It'd be nice to include that somewhere. I, um, I was calling it a Blu-ray edition with all the extras. <laughs> yeah, someone, I get someone asked me if I had paid extra for some movie I bought during lockdown, and I said, there's, there's more extras. It was a film. It's yeah. great. There's all these interviews and, and stuff. So I think we need Blu-ray comics. Okay. You know, with the digital, you know, that's something that you can actually sort of look at doing. question popped up there. How far into the future have you planned the studies in space to work? Um... Yes. About, uh, I, I would say. Have we lost part there? Have no, part? I can hear you. Can everyone hear us? How yeah. far into the future? Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks. I'd say good, about. Good. Yes. Um, that, that I've got the practical essentials of, of all the stories. Uh, I haven't probably got uh, the ending on any of them, or at least, what should we say, end of book one, end of book two, etc because I want to see how the artists pace the stories and also how far I get into the characters. Um, now, I know in a movie, uh, you always work back from the ending, uh, but in a comic, especially when it's uh, episodic, um, you have to work back from each section because 
uh, the readers, uh, particularly younger readers, have no tolerance for a great ending, you know, uh, 50 pages down the line. You know, they want jam on their bread right here, right now. So uh, it's a different, um, it's a different flavor, if you like, to writing for, what should we say, um, uh, adult readers exclusively, who can be quite tolerant of uh, um, going with the writing craft and, and slowing things down. Younger readers won't. They want, they want it in your face right here, right now. And they, if, you, if I had to make a choice, I, I would always prioritize that younger mainstream audience. Um, and thus far, that seems to have paid off, I think, yeah. Another question I was asked, Pat, was um, the European market. Um, how healthy is that at the moment, or has it stagnated a, a bit? Um, I well, whenever you talk to the French, they will always say, "Oh, it's not very good. This has gone wrong. That's gone wrong," and 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 all the rest of it. Because I think that's a that's an international comic fan phenomena, isn't it? You know, oh, things aren't very good at the moment. You know what I mean? Um, but what I would say is that the, um, the Bon Dessine shops, as far as I know, uh, the majority are there. They'll obviously have been hit by COVID. And I think uh, France in particular will have a problem because um, they, they don't ascribe to, to digital in a way that uh, uh, the Americans do. And uh, we Brits will tolerate a certain amount of digital uh, comics, not too much, but a bit. Um, but I think on balance, yeah, I think the European market is, is still healthy. And uh, um, I, I have a series, Requiem Vampire Night, uh, where the artist is, uh, Olivia Ledoire, is returning to it, I think in uh, two years which if you're an editor, you will know means three years. <laughs> <laughs> One of my favorite comics. Yeah, I, I, I wish it would be complete, but there you go. It's, uh, I'm at his mercy, yeah. Now, I'm not sure how to do this, but I'd quite like a participation from some of the other people who have joined us. Um, is, is there a button one presses or do you wave your hands and attract my attention or put something up on chat and I'll see your name? It's just like that for a few seconds. You can press raise hand. I'm not sure um, whether you actually see. Can you guys see that I got my hand raised from before? You have to open the participants hand. box. Anthony, you might want to talk to Bruno as well. Bruno hasn't had a say yet. Oh, yeah. Oh, Bruno, right. Okay. Where's <laughs> Bruno? I had a bit of a trouble, like, setting this thing up. So, yes. I think we are head ready to go now. Okay, Bruno. Um, how, did, how did you get involved with Space Warp? And have you, have you enjoyed the process? Uh, I saw that Pat was looking for artists on Facebook. And uh, and I, I just got in touch, and I, I've done originally I done like a tryout for a different strip on Space Warp, and uh, you know like Pat like found he, he found like the, the the right artist for that strip like the particular strip, and um, a couple of days later like he. He came back to me offering like a Jurassic Man because like a like as Simon explained like he had to drop out you know and like a, his yeah. health issues and and I was uh, yeah I'm more, more than happy like say yeah and uh, for me like it turns turned out like a quite like a right because. Uh, Jurassic Punk's like it seems to be like the perfect street for the kind of things I enjoy drawing, you know, which is like a, like a post-apocalyptic punk punks and uh, dinosaurs and and 
one thing about Simon original design to Space Warp, like it's the, uh, I tr I, I've done like, a, there's like a panel in Jurassic Funks where like you can see like the Space Warp like opening again. And, and originally I I drew the Space Warp like a, I, I say, I'm gonna do my own design and you know, and it was rubbish. Like it was like a total <laughs> And like uh, I, I'm quite ashamed actually to like oh I, I I've shown this this piece of crap to Pat you know like this this is terrible and they'll say okay I'm gonna do like the original design I'm gonna follow a uh, Simon's design for space warp and like a uh, and it was like yeah that's it you know like that's that's the space warp like this absolutely correct like I I don't have to add anything to it thank it you. Was, Spot on, man. Like, seriously, is 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 good, man. Great, great. Thank great you, job. man. That means a lot. Because I, I loved think... seeing your Jurassic Punks um, when I when I got to read it. I was like, this is this is brilliant. Like, it's distinctly different to mine, but I can also see, like, okay, yeah, I, I'd have drawn that like that. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> it's so cool. Oh, cheers, <laughs> man. Yeah. So that's that's like a you know, it's a testament like to. Simon's design, original design, as they like, yeah, there's nothing I can improve upon. Like, so I'm gonna do that. And like a pat was like a really happy like with the result. And I'll say, like, yeah, that's it. Like we we got it done. And it, it was it was a bit of a challenge. Um, you know, because uh it, I was I wasn't that like because the, the story is set in Liverpool, and I haven't been to Liverpool before starting working on the strip. So there was a point I say, okay, I need to go to Liverpool, like, and you know, like, I need to feel like those characters, you know, like I need to be in, in, in a, like, standing on the same spot, like, a, you know, and see like, like a, the geography of the action, you know, like where like the, the characters they they start out from and like. To the point like they get to the cathedral like so i say okay i'm gonna take my own picture you know, my own like a reference material like and as as mentioned previously like liverpool is beautiful like it's fantastic yeah Arch architecture that like it's just like this th there's nothing else like it is really like a, that kind of um art decor you know like uh early 20s you know like uh, it's it's fantastic and uh, i was like the, was, the, the city was itself the, is a character isn't it you know exactly and i was i was trying to because talk about like a new york and you get the that very specific iconography of new york like with like old marvel stuff like a dc comic stuff like a jack kirby drawing those uh water towers on the top of the buildings, you know, like the, the American trash can, like it, it became like a kind of iconographic, you know, for comics. And uh, with Liverpool, like say like, well, this could be exactly the same thing, you know, like for British comics, like you've got like yeah. a, a city like that, that's very like a remarkable, you know? And as Simon, Simon said, like a, is a character itself, like a mega city, like a, Gotten City, you know, like, and I, I, I try my best, you know, to make it justice, like to make like a Liverpool to look like a fantastical, but at the same time, grounded in reality, you know, like how the, the city look, looks like in reality. And uh, yeah, if, if you say like, uh, we got like a uh, Joe, Dada and Liverpool as like the main characters in Jurassic Punk. And it was yeah. great fun. Sorry, I enough, it's, um, Ian, Ian Rankin said to me many years ago, the one thing he liked about the bogeyman was the city of Glasgow in it, because yeah. he could see all the architecture in the city as a character. And that's what he aims at in his rabus novels, that Edinburgh is one of the characters. It's an essential part of the story so i totally know what you're talking about there yeah. yeah yeah Pat, someone just asked did you find writing for space War different from the usual way in which you write for 2000 ad etc 
Oh. Oh. <laughs> um, no, I dropped it again. No, I, I heard you okay, John. There you are. Um, no, it's the, it was the same process. Okay. The same process, exactly the same process, um, with one significant difference, and this applies to the artists as well, um, that um, the meter is not ticking. Now, when I work for 2000 AD, um, because they pay peanuts royalties, the page rate's okay, but it's only okay if you don't spend time developing the story. Now, I've worked it out, and I, I would say that this is probably true for all of us in one form or another, but the development time on a story is around six weeks. Um, now, if it's a begat of a begat, it may be less. But if you're starting with something from cold, like uh, Jurassic Man, which then becomes Jurassic Punks, that process is around six weeks for a writer. Now, it's not all in one block, uh, but it happens. So what it means is that you go through, shall we say, uh, three drafts, which is normal for a writer. And, and the artist will go through a similar process. If they were to clock up the amount of time they spent, but the nature of selling all rights comics is that you have to look for shortcuts because you've got to pay your mortgage. You've got to feed your kids. So what do you do? So you are giving Rebellion six weeks work and nothing. And that obviously is very difficult. And I've had uh, two well-known 2000 AD artists who've actually had to turn down scripts because they know that they can't spend that amount of time uh, developing things. So on Space Warp, there is that six week development time. And as the, the comic continues to sell well over a period of time, hopefully shorter rather than later, uh, the artist and the writer will get back, not just their page rate, so to speak, but additional royalties, uh, which will cover that development time. So that's the major difference for all of us is, we're thinking, um, ah, let's move it from New York to Liverpool. And then, well, let's change this character and that character. That's a normal part of the creative process. But when you're working for 2000 AD, you can't do that. You've just got to go bang, that's the way it is. And that's why, uh, uh, you get this kind of begat writers and artists who are building on the past so that they don't have to go through the development time, um, which is not painful. It's only painful when you don't get paid for it or it's not valued or appreciated. <laughs> uh, but I can assure everyone on Space Warp, all that agonizing that uh, Bruno was describing where he does one version of the warp and then he says, no, it's not right. Let's go for another. That, that's how things should be. And, and creators should be able to say, right, I'm gonna put that in the bin and start again, uh, rather than, oh my God, as, as um, is it Ron Smith, the uh, 2000 AD artist, brilliant artist. Uh, I don't know how he managed this, but uh, his artwork was always wonderful. But you probably know the story where he had um, an hourglass or something. And the, as the sands of time ran out, he turned his page to the wall and said, right, that's your lot. You've got your money's worth. That's it. And then when you look at what he was doing, that's incredible. But on Space Warp, we don't have that. Uh, and I don't think any of the artists have got a sense of, well, the clock's ticking. You know, you've, you've, you know, you've got your lot. And um, so that's the big difference, I think. Part will uh, Space Warp be available in other languages? I mean, you're, you're, you're based in Europe where, uh, you know, Scotland used to be a member of Europe, but uh, England took us out of it. Um, and, and is Facebook going to appear in other languages? The obvious one would be France, I think. Um, and I think the... I, I, I would imagine that to make it work in France, we would probably have to have several issues uh, because they're going to say, well, when's the next issue? This kind of stuff, <laughs> as they do in Britain as well. Um, so a one-off uh, might be a little bit of a hard sell. 
The good news, though, is that years ago, uh, the French would always say, oh, no, it has to be in full colour. And uh, that's, no longer, that's no longer true. Charlie's War has probably sold better in France than in the UK, uh, which has got something to do with the, um, uh, the, the sort of controls, really, in, in, in the UK. France is much more open to critical appraisal of, of things like the Great War. Um, so anyway, that's all black and white, and they love it. So there's no reason, theoretically, why Space Warp shouldn't sell in France. What do you think? Uh, yeah, and I'm also thinking um, about the possibilities of, of it being in Spanish because of the South American market as well. Um, and I think these days it's sort of, especially in the, on the digital side, it's re relatively easy to, to give that a go. Um, and, and um, you know, to try it digitally before you, before you commit to print. Um, sort of thing. Although even even with print on demand, you, you're not really making a, a huge financial investment because um, you know you don't have to warehouse stock or, or anything like that. Um, I would I would love to to go down that road. I think that would be really exciting. But yeah, I I assume that we would want to get volume two out so that we've got a sense of um, continuity a, 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 yeah, and volume and, yeah. a, and a series and um, and and a sort of a feeling of longevity to it before before that, but I would I would definitely be up for that. I think that would be great. And you know, modern uh, the platforms, things like Comixology and Amazon, um, make all that stuff you know actually really accessible. I don't know if you know, but um, Marvel New York used to have a Spanish language department, and they published their comics. For about a year in Spanish, sadly, the, the, the lady in charge died uh, very uh, suddenly, I think. Um, but they published their comics in Spanish because it's the biggest language, I think, in North America. Um, never mind South America. North America? Um, wow. So, yeah, it's, it's worth exploring uh, in other languages. Yeah. So there we go. Eh? We better comics history there. Um, Gareth. Uh, I'm aware we haven't spoken to you for ages and ages, um, uh, and I hope you've been enjoying yourself listening to the rest of it. Uh, um, and I think Steve Tanner just joined us, and indeed Steve uh, and I, with Dave Cook, are speaking later this afternoon in another part of I Love Comics. Um, so are you looking forward to issue two and subsequent issues, Gareth? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, it's certainly something I'd, I'd want to be involved in. Um, I've loved, like I say, the development of the characters and the environment so far. I'd like to see more um, more of the world coming through Pat's writing. So um, I'm excited to find out what, what comes next for, for the guys. So, so the never, it's going to be the never-ending story, just Space, space War 100, uh, Lux. I'm, I'm sure the executioners have gone. I, I remember years ago. Yeah. <laughs> I remember years ago when uh, Dave Sims started Cerebus and he told everyone he was going to do 300 issues and we all said, yeah, that'll be right. <laughs> but he did. He did 300 self-published issues and they're all still in print in, yeah. in volumes. So, uh, yes, it can be done. Can I just ask everybody, all the participants, um, what do you read? Um, it's all very well to produce stuff, but do you actually read comics yourself, Gareth? Yes, I do. I've got a big collection. Um, if I look off camera that way, I can see a whole bunch of them there. And um, yeah, so I, I, I kind of grew up, I suppose, reading 2000 AD, ABC Warriors, Slain. Um, and, and um, before that, obviously, kind of like the Beano and, and, and some of those kind of weird early Star Wars comics that were kind of tied into the movies. But it was years later, I was working for an archaeology unit, and um, the guy who ran the archaeology unit um, was a comic book creator themselves. They were actually making their own independent Beowulf kind of uh, comic. And they, um, they were selling, oh. them, selling them mail order back before, long before the internet. 
Um, and several people in the, the design studio there basically were into comics and they kind of got me back in. So I, I came back into comics, I suppose, around the time of Dark Knight Returns, Ronin, um, Watchmen and all that lot. And then um, moving away to art school, there was a comic book store, um, Abstract Sprocket in Norwich, which is fantastic and uh, still going. And I used to pick up my weekly order there and I've still got loads of comics and I still buy them now. I've got loads of kind of like French and... Spanish comic, Bilal, um, Mobius, um, sort of Philip Druyer, all that kind of stuff. Um, noir comics, uh, like, you know, things like Torpedo and all that kind of stuff I've, uh, in my collection. I'm, I'm, I'll, I read a lot of horror comics, I suppose. Um, I like that kind of stuff. But my big thing is, is, is um, you know, anything that's got a, a, a tinge of a cult detective or kind of like mythical monsters and stuff like that, that's where my head's at. So. <laughs> Cool. I like it, Gareth. Yeah. yeah. I've just been corrected. Uh, apparently, Cerebus is now out of print, but uh, it's still, it lasted 300 issues and it was in print for some years. So I'll I'll keep it at that. Bruno, do, do you still read some, do you still read comics? And who are your favourites? Hello, is Bruno here? Bruno. Oh, Bruno, I think Bruno's not at his desk. Right, okay. He's probably going to the toilet. <laughs> Somebody just mentioned Black Sad in the, in the things there. Yes, yes I saw it so up there. Beautiful. Yeah. So beautiful. That's a beautifully drawn comic. Yep. Yep. No, I agree with, I agree with Black Sad. Is, is Ian there, Ian Ashcroft? Yeah, I'm here. Um, hello, Ian. Do hello. Do you read comics? Uh, I, I do now. I didn't when I was younger. I didn't. They just ah. weren't part. They weren't part of anything that my like friends were into really. So um, I got into comics in kind of two ways. So the first time was I was sat in a library in Cleethorpes, which is where I've moved to, and um, I just they had a shelf comic and while my daughter was sort of very young I, and um, I saw the work of Jay Lee and I really liked that and I thought oh this is a really good medium and then um, funny enough I, fe I fell into like just trying to find loads of different art artists originally that I really liked and that actually led me to The Horned God by Pat and then I read that I really enjoyed that the idea that like I suppose I've only really been into comics for about five or six years the idea of reading that book in the sort of like that first year of getting into comics and then actually working with him five years later just it's amazing and then um the other thing was at the school I work in my my TA her husband actually I didn't realize this at the time but he wrote for 2000 AD he created, ah. he created a character that got <laughs> It didn't get a great reception, but he created a character called Cinnamon and uh, later one called Bison, and he'd written for Calibre Comics as well, and I think he'd done a bit for Image. So he really helped me when I started out because he was giving me scripts that I could do. Like, I created, like, a massive portfolio, all of sequential art that I took around Thought Bubble, and that's where I got my work with Accent UK before I started working with Pat. So it's all been quite a, a recent development, really, in my life. But I mean, some of the best artwork I'm, I see now, it's all comic artwork. I, I actually try and absorb as much of it as I can. And like Gareth was saying, European artists and Spanish artists as well. Um, just try and grab as much in, influences as I can. Um, and that's it, really. That's how that's how I got into yeah. it. I was always aware of comics because my cousin actually did collect 2000 AD, but it just wasn't something that we... I think I would have enjoyed comics, but the way it was when I was growing up, it was just um, no one did. So um, I never I never got involved in it when I was younger, but I certainly am now, and it's, it's amazing. I love it. That's, that's interesting. You didn't really grow up with comics. Um, no. I grew up with that's true of a lot of people. I, I grew up with book illustration then, and, you and I, can, I can remember really being interested in book illustration and Edmund Edmund Delac and, and people like that. And, and 
that was probably what my fam what was in my family home when I was growing up. So and, and like little things like ladybird books, some of them were beautifully illustrated as well. And I can remember I cut copy out of them and stuff like that. So maybe not comics, but book illustration was definitely there. Okay, yeah, I get you. Yeah, I was into that as well. Uh, Simon, what what do you read? Um, I I read a bit of everything to be honest. I, I'm heavily into um, stuff like Edgar Allan Poe. I like very dark poetry, and that's where a lot of my inspiration comes from. But I still read like 2000 AD. I go constantly over Pat stuff because it's just so revisitable. I read a lot of the Marvel comic stuff as well. Um, Deadpool, Wolverine, and Iron Man were always like right up there for me. Um, but a lot of my inspiration comes from video games, to be honest. Uh, you, you can see the systems behind me, and but I've got all that on the shelves, and of course, the Star Wars stuff and whatnot. Um, but yeah, video games are a huge part of my life, because again, escape is very easy with those. And a lot of the stories in video games are very much like comics. Um, you've got this visual interpretation of like a, a, a single story that focuses on characters very deeply in the same way that the comics do. And it, they try to catch your attention in that same way. Um, and so it depends on my mood on the day, whether I'll pick up a comic or I'll pick up a video game controller. Um, of course, like my left hand being partially paralyzed, I've had to again adapt to that and get like special equipment for it. But it, it's, it's really interesting how games are so much like comics. Um, and you can even see it in like the, the culture now. Kids have gone away from comics somewhat and gone more into video games. And I do think like if they could do tie-ins to video games to comics, you know, and like it would revitalize both sides of the industry for people, I believe. Um, but yet yeah, it's a bit of Marvel for me. It's a lot of sci-fi, a lot of horror. Um, I like really dark comics to be honest when i'm reading them I, 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 anything that's got a very deep um story that you can really relate to you know something where the, the characters actually have emotion and feeling not the throwaway comics which were a lot of the marvel ones so i i'm <laughs> Some of them are like others I can pick up and go, I, I really can't get on with that. It, it's got to be, as I say, the deep comics. The first comic I ever read by Pat was eight years old. It was The Horned God. Um, when, when Ian mentioned it just, uh, when you I was were like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I loved that. I, I had it, like I said, passed to me on my eighth birthday. So it was about two months after it had come out, actually. And um, yeah, that, that's what got me hooked, slain. And um, I read a lot of slain. The Dark Judges um, from 2000 AD are a particular fascination of mine. I think a lot of the stories that they do for the Dark Judges are fascinating. Um, and I'll reread those over and over because of the artwork as well. There's a lot of glorious artwork in those. Nick Percival does some really interesting artwork um, for 2000 AD on the Dark Judges stuff. It's it, it's like watercolor paintings and yeah i'm not usually a fan of color for horror art but he, he hits the nail on the head and um yeah like i say it's a lot of, of dark stuff um uh, i also watch a lot of stuff like um of black mirror which relates to future shock i think from 2000 ad they're very you know yeah, yeah. they're, they're very like, synchronized yeah, yeah. And yeah. um, it, it's stuff like that, stuff that makes you think. That's what I like from comics. Um, yes, I do like you throw away characters like Deadpool and whatnot, because that's what they are. They're, you pick them up once and th there's not really much chance to revisit, apart from Night of the Living Deadpool. Um, they did like a crossover. And again, that was quite a dark story because it, it sees Deadpool and the world is ended. So he's like the only guy left. Um, <laughs> and it, it's really interesting that is you've just got zombies but Deadpool can actually hear the zombies and they're, they're going like I don't want to eat people what's going on <laughs> so that, those are really interesting comics um, but yeah 
the darker the better. I've even got um, some Edgar Allan Poe. It's called Nevermore, I think, that was translated into a comic. Um, stuff like that fascinates me. Um, I think it's Joe O'Barr that did The Crow. His yes. stuff. Yeah, I, I, I loved that growing up. Um, that I, I went through about three copies of that because the covers kept on falling off because of how much I read them. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I, the early 2000 AD stuff, uh, anything black and white really draws me um, into it. As you can probably see by my artwork, I love yeah. those black and white aesthetics. Um, I think they bounce off the page a lot more than colour. Colour can easily get muddied up to the eye. Um, if you've got a colour, like six or seven panels of colour on a page, you've got to actually really pay attention to each panel to pick it up. Whereas the black and white stuff, as soon as you open it, it's in your face, it's there, and you can see everything that's on the page without having to concentrate. It's like, wow, that's good art. Whereas with the colour ones, you have to look for the art behind the colour almost. Um, so anything black and white, I'll pick up, to be honest, as well. <laughs> yeah, quite varied. <laughs> yeah, I get you. Although I don't know if they're going to loan you any copies of The Crow because obviously you'll completely destroy them. But uh, <laughs> anyway, no, I, I, uh, Phil really Vaughn was making a wee... Um... <laughs> <laughs> Is Phil there? Um, you were making a wee point about games design, Phil. Yeah, uh, just to pick up on the gone. point that, that, that there's a myth that... that that sort of video games killed comics in, in the 80s. And it's not entirely true. There's an element of that, I think. But what interested me, I used to work in the games industry and uh, a lot of the comics contacts that I've got are actually from the video games industry when a lot of comic artists moved over to concept yeah. art. And uh, that that was a, that, a... And that still happens. It's not very well publicised, but there's quite a lot of crossover of people working both ways, you know, um, comic creators. I actually comics. did concept art for video games before, like, ever touching um, comic art. Right. Yeah, there's definitely more crossover than people think. And, you know, they're, they're compatible up to a point, I think. <laughs> you know, obviously, the storytelling aspects are different. Um, even if you're storyboarding video games. I used to work on cutscenes yeah. for video games, but you would storyboard that in a completely different way than you would create a comic. Um, but the, the core skills are the same. So I think it's interesting that crossovers often kind of, well, not frowned upon, but there's often this myth that, yeah, you know, kids are, uh, don't have time for, for comics. And I've got to admit, I don't particularly find that to be true, personally speaking. In the it's not that they don't have time for it, in my opinion. I think they, they, they sort of spend their money more on it, if you get what I mean by that. Um, yeah. And also, it's more what I mean by the advertising to kids um, games are very much in your face now, whereas like in the 80s and 90s, it was comics that were more in your face in shops um, that were easier to find. Now yeah. it's more difficult to find comics on shelves for kids. Um, and, and so they don't see them to pick up. Whereas the games that they're, they're pushed on them, like all over Facebook and social media, games are very much like post, post, post about gaming, all YouTube and everything. It's all about gaming. And, um, yeah, for me, I, I, it, it's not so much that the kids don't want to pick them up or haven't got time. It's more how the media publicise each of them. So, as I say, before comics were pushed towards kids, now it's more games and like digital apps and stuff that are pushed on the kids. Um, and the kids will like pick up. I've got kids myself that will happily pick up comics. They love them, um, but. The gaming is what's thrown upon them almost. It's not that they don't want to read the comics or anything. It's just what's pushed on. And that's why I'm like, if they did crossovers, I think they'd do great. Like, as in, if the, the games came out with a comic, um, I think kids would happily sit and read them. They, they, they love it. Yeah, there's not, that, much, there's, not, there. there's not as much of that as you'd think. And I think the problem is as well with news agents and over the last 20 years or so, you can't go into a, a, a sort of news agent anymore and pick up a comic and, and flick through it because most of them are yeah. bad. You know, um, it, it's, yeah. it's slightly falling out of favour that. But I think the idea of cross, proper crossover with, um, with, with games is something... Uh, it, it's an interesting point uh, uh, that Pat made about the cover design and, and, it, and it kind of pointing towards a sort of Fortnite type of, of styling and design work. I think that's, yeah. that's important. I think even, you know, considering Rebellion's a games company, I'm surprised there's not more crossover there between... Yeah, exactly. 
and, and, and the games. I think, yeah, I think so it's about right. getting them into the spaces that, that um, kids inhabit. And there's, I'm not going to use the word gatekeeping because I don't think that's really it. It's, there's a kind of a cultural reticence, I think, on the part of so, some teachers and some parents that basically see comics as lower art. And, yes, definitely. And, and, and so to get comics into the hands of kids, you, you need adults there to allow that to happen. Yeah. Um, and there's other situations as well where it's obvious. I mean, cinema is is, is a massive thing with culture with, with comic crossovers, but I still think that people are missing a trick. If they really want the comics industry to survive, then you put spinners in the in the foyers of cinemas, and the, the comic book movie that's out that week or that month yeah. has comics on the racks, because then you're going to self-fulfill that continuation of an audience from one to yeah. the other. And they can come out of the cinema. And they want the next movie straight away, but instead of a movie, there's a comic book that they can take up, and then there's yeah, another yeah. comic, and then there's another comic, and then there's another comic, and there's like forty comics between that movie and the next movie. But and let's face reason, it, it's like some, for some reason I think that it's almost like lawyers have drawn a line between the media representations of the same kind of like IP, and so you can't show the comic books and the and the films in the same in the same space, which yeah. is odd when you look at the logo for all the companies that sort of like make films about comics because they try and show it there. But it, it it has been you know that thing. I mean, I, I used to teach as well. I, I used to teach games design and illustration, and um, the the amount of kids that would come and you, you go right, okay, this comic, that comic, and even film. To be fair, the the lack of awareness of some of those those bits of media that you know that we all grew up on. For, for yeah. whatever reason, but it just doesn't seem to be into the hands of some of the kids, which is a shame. Whereas in other cultures, obviously in Europe, and I think it's a big thing, we know why it's seen as low art in America, you know, because of the whole kind of like, um, you know, the um, the kind of like the, the court cases and everything that came about. Mm -hmm. And I don't think it's ever recovered. And it's a weird thing when you consider yeah. that, I suppose, comics, out of all of this stuff, even if you include games, comics are seen as the the kid of visual media, the child of visual media, yet mm -hmm. it's probably as old, if not older than cinema, which makes yeah. it one of the oldest, you know, barring painting and sculpture and dance, it's it's one of the oldest, you know, so it's, it's weird. As you were saying, um, comics are sort of almost frowned upon by a lot of people. And I've had conversations with friends that I've known for years that have gone, oh, I didn't read comics as a kid, I read books, thank you. And you're like, why are you looking down your nose? You know, it's it's still it's still reading. It's still getting entertainment. I mean, let, let's face it. Look at something like Fifty Shades of Grey, for example. You can't tell me that that's more <laughs> intellectual than a comic. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> and, and the, thing is, the, the thing is, the thing about it is, is comics comics are different. And yes, there are maybe some sort of like crossovers between you know storylines and the choice of stories between sort of like the mainstream comics and mainstream games. And maybe there is a, a visual connection to cinema in the fact that it's sequential and that storyboards sometimes look a little like comics. And yes, there's the same connection to, to novels in the fact that you can tell any kind of story in comics and everything like that. But comics are incredibly different. And I was I was I did a workshop for some guys down at DEFRA in Bristol about comics. I was invited to go down there and talk about comics because they were looking at passing information um to people who don't have a lot of time to to um, absorb information and they were looking at new ways to deal with it. And, and so they were, they, we had a discussion about using comics to get information about environmental concerns and climate change over yeah. to people who only have a few moments and how you can do it. And, um, and it was interesting. So, you know, the, my, my part of the workshop was basically discussing the fact that on a single page, on a single page of a comic book, you can have multiple timelines running at the same time Mm. Multiple, multiple conversations happening in different rooms and different environments, beginnings and endings of stories all shown on the same page, and yet the physical turning of a page will also still add a surprise into it. And those properties yeah. of comics are completely unique and don't happen in other media at all. Even yeah. split screen cinema and TV doesn't have the same properties where you can look at the images at the same time and read the dialogue that's happening crossed over. You can have voiceovers by characters that aren't in the room you can have a whole yeah. range of different sort of narrative structures happening in comics that just don't happen in any other medium 
I think that very much with the Deadpool movies that came out in in the comics, he's got like about seven personalities, and they're done with like different color and different shape bubbles. It's shown in the comics, so that you see that it's a different person talking in his head each time. And of course, there's no way of showing that on cinema. That and I you... don't think it's been fully explored either. I don't think. Yeah. I don't think comic, comics aren't a done medium where everything's been explored. Absolutely. I think they're underexplored, and I think there's still in physical in. If we're thinking about comics as physical print, and obviously mm. multiple options for, for, for digital, but yeah. in physical print, the actual physical boundaries of the comic book have not been fully explored yet as a totally story. agree. As especially as, like uh, I think, guys, yeah. Uh, just good to see we've got about 10 minutes left. Um, Pat, uh, you seem to have uh, an absolutely great uh, team around you who are all committed to this new project. I take it you're quite pleased with how things turned out with space work? I'm absolutely delighted. Yeah. Lost part. Uh, it's, it's very exciting, yeah. And uh, I'm just wondering, in the time we have left, I see there's quite a number, or have been a number of questions running down the side. Is there anyone in particular that jumps out? There, there was one you mentioned to me uh, ahead of the... Um, uh, this, this Zoom session. Um, I think it was something to do with uh, um, how the industry split works, how royalties work. Um, I haven't got it in front of me, but shall I address that one? Yes, why not? Yes. Okay. Um, well, the, the industry standard on comics, uh, and it, it, this is a universal rule, there will be variations, um, but it's, it's pretty much there, is 50% to publisher, 25% uh, to writer, 25% to artist. And as I say, there'll be variations on that. And that applies to uh, certainly to France. And it probably applies one way or another to, uh, to DC comics and Marvel and so forth. Um, now, uh, when you have uh, comic companies that buy all rights, uh, they, DC Thompsons, for example, uh, they, they don't pay anything. Uh, Rebellion <laughs> pay uh, a, a very small percentage, which is way below industry standard. Um, so to give you an example of how that works, um, got here, um, this is the um, Hachette edition, the one that sold in newsagents. And Slane was the number one starter. So they, they brought it out at... Uh, at a low price and with a low uh, uh, rubbish royalties on it, um, yeah. that meant that uh, what Rebellion themselves um, described as the crown jewels of 2000 AD, uh, I made 129 quid, uh, which is disgraceful. Um, yeah. Now, by comparison, um, and I think the question I was asking, how does it work on Space War? Well, we could have gone in at 50% uh, to publisher, 25% to artist, 25% to writer, but we felt that would, uh, well, it sounds unfair because Lisa's the publisher, so it'd be like seven, like 75% or something. Uh, you to, mean to us. To us. Collectively. Yeah, yeah. so we, we worked on a different principle uh, above industry standards. So it's a third to writer. <laughs> a third to artists and a third to publisher. And, and I think that that's, that's feels better for uh, all round. It, it that creates this sense of teammanship, I think. And, uh, and it works. And as I was saying earlier, uh, we've paid the artists um, the uh, royalties already within three months. Um, the page rates. Yeah, yeah. Uh, they, they, yeah, and obviously they, they go on getting royalties in the future, uh, but we've met that page rate already. Now, if we can do that within three months, what is happening with millionaires who own Rebellion, who are paying me that by comparison? Um, it's shameful. And one of the reasons for doing Space Warp, which I think is important, is as I say, I, I could moan about this forever, but the answer is to, you, you've got to get out and provide an alternative. 
And that's happened often in the past in comics. There's a, there's a long tradition of this, um, really before our generation, um, the original eagle, uh, although I don't agree with its uh, social politics, so to speak, it came out because they wanted to, to prove something. And it was a huge success, uh, the original eagle, that they wanted to bring out what you might call, I suppose, middle-class values. And, and it worked. And of course, it was hated by the comic establishment who cheered when it eventually died a decade or so later. Um, because it's the outsiders challenging the status quo, the establishment, and, and that's what, where we're at today. So that's the context of, of what we're doing on uh, Spacewalk. Listen, I'd uh, just like to thank everybody for their participation today. I'm sorry that I didn't have more skills in um, Zoom technique. I'll, I'll keep by Zoom for dummies or something like that. At um, least you weren't a cat. Foot up on it, uh, or maybe somebody could could do a comic book zoom for me. <laughs> Sorry, Simon. I said at Sorry, least Simon. you didn't appear as a cat. What was that? Oh. You didn't appear as a cat. Um, Simon's <laughs> fading there. Ha <laughs> <laughs> ha! Yes, yes, uh, yes. I I I noticed that uh, error that person had made the other day. So I'm using a different operating system and, uh, and a different version of Zoom. So we've managed to do that. So anyway, I'd just like to thank everybody. Lest, lest everybody suddenly disappears because the signal goes, um, I'm just going to kind of wind it up there. There are other things on today on um, I Love Comics. So please check out uh, the website, etc., and comic scene. And remember, um, we've got a hundred issue comic scene history of comics. Uh, so your favourite comics should um, appear there at some point. Someone mentioned earlier on uh, Al Al Ewing's um, Immortal Hulk, which I've been thoroughly enjoying. Just to just to make sure that we've we've mentioned Al's comic there um, and Space Warp has, has been as we, we've obviously agreed an enormous success so I'd like to thank everybody especially thanks to Lisa and Pat for joining us from I hope sunny Spain this is me speaking from very snowy slippy Glasgow it's, it's, it's definitely um, and it's great to see something like Zoom that when we are locked down and we can't get a convention, at least we can have a, a rare 